Welcome everyone. Let's get you in and settled. All right. I'm going to get us started. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live virtual program presented by the Howell Carnegie District Library and the League of Women Voters of Livingston County. I'm Jamie from the Reference Adult Services Department here at the library. Thank you for joining us this evening. I have a few housekeeping items to share before we get started. Tonight's program is scheduled to run until 8 p.m. It will begin with a presentation by our speaker, followed by time for audience questions. To reduce distraction during our speaker's presentation, all attendees will be muted. You may share any questions for the presenter in the chat during that time, and they will be addressed during the question and answer session. During the question and answer, if you wish to ask a question at that time, let us know in the chat or use the raise hand option under reactions and we'll unmute you. We'll address as many audience questions as we can before the program ends. Throughout the program, please report any technical issues you may have in the chat. Subtitles have been enabled for this program. If you want to turn these off, click the small up arrow next to live transcript in the bottom menu bar and select hide subtitles. This program is being recorded and the recording will be available on the library's YouTube channel soon after this live virtual program. If you do not want your video in the recording, please make sure your video stays off that there is a little red slash through the camera icon on the bottom left corner of your Zoom window. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to Ellen Lafferty, the chairperson of our local League of Women Voters of Livingston County. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I wanna to take a moment, as always, to especially thank the Howell Carnegie Library and tonight's virtual host, technology host, Jamie Perdue for making this virtual platform available to all of us this evening. Tonight, the League of Women Voters of Livingston County are pleased to host an educational evening to help us understand, this is a mouthful, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact Initiative, which has the support of the League of Women Voters both nationally and at the state level. If you're unfamiliar with the work of the League, we are a nonpartisan organization that neither supports or opposes political parties or candidates. The League remains one of the most trusted sources of nonpartisan election information for American voters. We are a nonprofit group that is dependent on individual memberships and donations to the League in order to be able to provide evenings such as this to Livingston County voters. We encourage you to learn more about the League and perhaps consider joining us through our website, lwvlivingstonco.org. And now I'd like to introduce our guest for the evening, Eileen Reavy. Eileen is a co-founder of the grassroots advocacy group that pushed for the state of Oregon to pass the, I'm gonna, it's gonna go into acronyms here, NPV bill in 2016. She's now working to apply those organizing lessons in other states as NPV's grassroots national director. We may well see more of Eileen in 2024 when the Michigan National Popular Vote Interstate Compact Initiative might appear on our ballot. A little bit on the educational background on Eileen. She has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and Public Policy from York College of Pennsylvania and a master's degree in environmental, natural resources and energy law from Lewis and Clark Law School. She is currently based in Portland, Oregon and has visited 14 states on behalf of the national popular vote. Eileen, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me, Ellen. I'm looking forward to the conversation and appreciate the introduction. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here. Just want to confirm you're all seeing the national popular vote logo now. Looks good. Thank you. All right, so today we are going to talk about how we elect the president currently, the flaws of the current system, and how we can move to a more equitable system where every vote is equal. So starting off with the basics, how do we elect the president now? We use the Electoral College. So on election day, you and I cast our ballots for the candidates of our choice, but the real vote is when electors meet in December and cast their ballots. So ultimately there are 538 people who their votes are the ones that decide who the next president of the United States is. 
states are allocated one electoral vote for every representative that they have in Congress. So at a minimum, each state has three because every state has at least two US senators and then one member of the House. So to win the presidency, you need to win a majority of electoral votes. So currently that number is 270. I'm sure that number sounds familiar. That's you know what we're counting to on election night. Uh, is that, that, and that's where that number comes from. It's a majority of the Electoral College. So who are these people? They, the electors decide who the next president is, and often we have no idea who they are. So the US Constitution gives explicit power to the states to decide how to choose their electors. So specifically, Article 1, Section 2 reads, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. So state legislatures pass laws about how to award their electoral votes. And this is a power that the Supreme Court has termed a plenary power or absolute power of the states. So currently, 48 of our states have the same law, which is that whoever receives the most votes in your state on election day is gets 100% of the electoral votes. So we refer to these as statewide winner take all laws. So in California, if you know the Democratic candidate gets more votes within the state, they get all 55 of California's electoral votes. Same thing in Texas, if the Republican candidate receives the most votes they, in the state, they get all 38 of Texas's electoral votes. So this map here shows the results from the 2020 election. So in 2020, if you are one of the 6 million Californians who cast a ballot for Donald Trump, or one of the 5.2 million Texans who cast a ballot for Joe Biden, your vote was effectively thrown out at the state line. The state law said, nope, sorry, the other person got more popular votes within our state. They get 100% of their electors going to cast ballots for them. So state law, how states have chosen to participate in the electoral college, is how we have ended up with this system where we have divergent elections, where the popular vote winner nationwide does not necessarily become the next president. So there are a number of problems resulting from the current system. So the one that I think we're all the most familiar with, of course, is that five of our presidents have lost the popular vote and won the electoral college and won the election. So five times in our nation's history, that might not sound like a lot, but we've only had 46 presidents. So 10% of the time we are ending up with someone who was not who, uh, you know, more people in the country supported. So uh, the ones that we're most familiar with, uh, of course, are in 2016 when Donald Trump won the electoral college vote, but lost the popular vote by about 2.8 million. Um, and then in 2000, George W. Bush lost the popular vote by about 550,000, uh, but won the electoral college over Al Gore. So those are the ones that most people know about. Uh, what people often are less aware of is the fact that this almost happened two other times just in the first 20 years of this century. So the reason for this is we are in an era of very close elections. Um, so we had our divergent elections in 2000 and 2016. Um, we almost had another one in 2004. So immediately on the heels of the 2000 election. So in 2004, if 60,000 more voters in Ohio had cast their ballot for John Kerry instead of George Bush, John Kerry would have won Ohio, won the Electoral College and become the next president despite losing the popular vote by a larger margin than Donald Trump did in 2016. So we were very close to having it go the other way where a Democrat was put in office over a Republican just four years after the 2000 election. And if 60,000 votes sounds like a lot, 115 million ballots were cast across the country this in that year. So 60,000 voters in one state changing their mind is really not that uh, large of an amount. And then the other time that this very, very nearly happened was of course in 2020. So we were less than 22,000 votes away from Donald Trump uh, winning the electoral college despite losing the popular vote by over 7 million votes. 
So this is because of the razor thin margins uh, that happens in a, several swing states or those battleground states. Um, so to have had a different outcome with the presidential election in 2020, um, Donald Trump would have had to have flipped just 5,200 votes in Georgia, or excuse me, 5,200 votes in Arizona, 5,900 votes in Georgia, and 10,300 votes in Wisconsin. Those are very small numbers when we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the 2020 election with 180 million people voting. So we were very close to this happening again. Um, and regardless of who you supported uh, in any of these elections, it comes down to the fact of, does it really make sense that one candidate can get 7 million more votes across the country and very nearly lose the election? So uh, other problems that stem from the current way that we elect the president. Um, so number one, uh, we have some advantages that battleground states get. And so that's the term that we use um, for the states that where the election really happens. So our battleground states or our swing states. So winner take all laws that the states use means that most states are decidedly Republican or decidedly Democratic in terms of the presidential election before the election even begins. So the candidates in the general are campaigning for a small number of states uh, that happen to be closely divided in an election year. So those are the swing states, the battleground states. You know, I could tell you pretty easily uh, for the 2024 election without knowing who the candidates are gonna be, how about 38 of the states are gonna vote. You know, I, we know how California is gonna vote. We know how Iowa and North Dakota and South Dakota are gonna vote. Um, and so as a result of that, the candidates know too. They don't campaign in California because they know that the Democrat is going to win. So why would the Democrat go there when it, they already know they're going to win? And why would the Republican go there when they know there's no chance of them winning that state? So as a result, the entire election happens in a dozen or less states uh, every four years. So examples of this, in 2012, 100% of the general election campaign events were in just a dozen states. Um, notably, when we we have, you know, the dozen battleground states every election cycle for the last several years. But then by the end of the election, you're really getting down to just a handful of states that are getting all of the attention. So in 2012, two thirds of all general election campaign events were in just four states, Ohio, Florida, Virginia, and Iowa. So 38 states in that election were completely ignored by both general election candidates, um, including the entire West Coast, most of the South, except for Florida, um, and some of our most rural and agricultural states, just completely ignored in the election. Similarly, in 2016, virtually all campaign events were again in just a dozen states, and two thirds of all events came down to just six states. Now, when you're looking at this map, you might say, okay, but there's events in California and in Washington and in Texas. So, you know, are you wrong? Was there a chance of it going a, a different way? Um, the reason for those outlying numbers uh, is because at that time, candidate Donald Trump, uh, he really likes to have rallies. And so when he would go to places like California for a fundraising event, he would then want to have a public event as well. He would want to have a rally. Um, so he did that for about the first half of the general election um, before he stopped, I think, probably because he was wisely uh, uh, persuaded that that was not something he needed to do and was not helping him and that he should be focusing on the battleground states, which of course he did extremely effectively. Uh, and then in 2020, again, even with uh, events being virtual, so many of them because of Zoom, you know, if there ever was an election where we could have seen campaign events in all 50 states, we very easily could have had it happen, you know, uh, over the internet uh, in 2020. But that's not what happened. Uh, in 2020, uh, just Florida and Pennsylvania alone received 37% of all campaign events. So battleground states have this outsized power um, because they're attracting all its attention during the general election. Um, and the impacts of them go beyond just campaigning. You know, sometimes people will say, well, why do I care? I don't care if the candidates come to my state uh, in a general election, or, or maybe I live in a state that has an early primary, so I get to meet the, all of the candidates uh, earlier on, and so I feel like that's, that's good enough for me. Um, but the impacts of this really go beyond just, uh, you know, where did candidates touch down and, and who are they talking to? 
So examples of this. Um, so Dr. John Hudak from the Brookings Institute found that between 1996 and 2008, and overall controlling for variables, including a state size, uh, you know, natural disaster relief funding, presidential election swing states received 7.6% more federal grants than safe states that were worth about 5.7% more grant dollars between that 1996 and 2008 period. Um, and that's from discretionary grant dollars. So this equates to huge amounts of money, even though 7%, 5% might not sound like it. We're talking about the federal budget. Uh, so these are big dollars. So as an example, so during that time period, Tennessee was an average sized state in this country. If they had been a swing state leading in the 20, 2008 election, they, you could have expected them to have received 300 more federal grants in 2007 for a total of $60 million in just one year. So if you know that you're, you're consistently on that cycle to be, uh, oh, we know this state is gonna still be a battleground next year, then for that four year period, you're getting an additional 1200 uh, discretionary grants worth a total of $240 million. Um, so this, this adds up to big numbers. Now, similarly, uh, highly competitive swing states get twice as many disaster declarations as non-competitive states. And a lot of money comes with those as well. And you know, when I think about federal uh, disaster declarations and, and uh, the support that comes with them, I imagine someone at, at you know, the Federal Office of Budget and Management really calculating, OK, how much was the local infrastructure impacted? Uh, was there already you know, another hurricane or natural event previously in the same state that's really taxing their resources? Um, you know, what, what are the local resources for them to respond? And you'd think there'd be this equation, but no, when it comes down to it, partisan politics are being played here um, because we're seeing that Congress is having twice as many of their disaster declarations going to swing states. And it's important to note you know, the, so the states and the programs that are recipients of these dollars, I'm sure are very deserving. You know, I, I don't mean to suggest that, oh, they're going to things that are uh, not uh, reasonable. They're going to projects that should be funded. But what is able to be happening here is that Congress and, and whoever is in the White House is able to use the federal tax dollars paid for by you and I and everyone around this country in order to try and curry favor with their political party in certain states to try and help them win the next presidential election. Um, so that is just a system that does not make sense. And then the, the third really uh, big thing that comes up within battleground states uh, is the impact that they have on policy. So we see candidates propose policies that are very specifically tailored towards uh, particular voters in particular states. So two examples of this. No Child Left Behind was proposed by a Republican candidate for president, George Bush. And after he won his election uh, and uh, implemented No Child Left Behind, that program was the largest federal action taken into public education in the history of our country. The federal government getting involved in something that has historically been run by states is not what you really expect from a Republican candidate for president, right? Uh, but this particular policy, uh, Ohio was one of the critical battleground states that year, and this was something that did very well with a critical voting block in Ohio, um, and which is suburban mothers uh, at the time. And as a result, that helped him win Ohio. That became a national policy. That law was signed into effect in the Cincinnati suburbs. And afterwards, swing states were twice as likely to get exemptions from No Child Left Behind as the rest of the country. On the other side of the aisle, uh, when uh, President Obama was running for re-election, he had a federal tax credit program promoting clean energy. Ohio companies got nearly four times the average that went to other states. So states that happen to be closely divided during an election year do benefit from their status as a battleground state. Um, and I'm sure a, a lot of you are sitting here thinking, okay, well, we live in Michigan and uh, that is very much a battleground state. It sounds like you're telling us the current system is great for us, um, but no. Uh, what you really should keep in mind when thinking about this is you are not always going to be a battleground state. You may not always live in Michigan. Uh, and the way that battleground status is, you are either 
a top tier state or you are completely ignored and out in the cold with the other, you know, 37 states across the country. There's not a middle ground. And so the perks of being a battleground state are fleeting. You know, states that were benefiting as recently as, you know, 2016, like Virginia and Colorado, completely ignored in the 2020 general election because they had moved into the safe democratic category um, for the presidential election. And so that uh, very well will continue to happen. I think that we might see that with Florida might move into the safe Republican category in the near future um, and won't be a battleground state anymore. And so that very much could happen in Michigan. Um, but also I think that, uh, you know, when we think about the system, if even if it benefits your state now, I'm sure you have friends, relatives, grandchildren that are attending schools or living in states all across the country. Uh, and does it really make sense that your vote could be incredibly more valuable than theirs when it comes to the presidential election, just based on where you live? So kind of summarizing the problems of the current system, it's really not helping the country, it's hurting the country. The candidate who wins less popular votes can and frequently does win the election. Every American's vote is not equal. And candidates are routinely ignoring the needs of voters in 38 states. So we're effectively really electing the president of the battleground states of America because that's who they're listening to. You know, and this has very real effects for this country. Um, again, regardless of how you feel about any particular president or presidential candidate, um, when we look at it, uh, five of our nine Supreme Court justices Currently, uh, well, I actually, I should say, I now with our newest justice, I need to change this number. I apologize. Four of our nine uh, Supreme Court justices uh, have been appointed by candidates who lost the popular vote. Um, that's a pretty big block. And, uh, you know what, actually, this is why I didn't change it. I'm sorry. Uh, the newest justice is uh, throwing me off. She is replacing someone who was uh, appointed by a president who won the popular votes, the numbers stay the same. I'm sorry, there are the, the new stat there is throwing me off. So it is five of our nine justices um, were, were appointed by, can by presidents who did not win the popular vote. And so you have a very critical uh, system in our country, our, our justice system. Uh, we all know that it has really big impacts on uh, our everyday lives and, and state laws and, and uh, a lot of things throughout the country. So. When you have people where over half of them that are making these very critical decisions were put into place by someone who not the most voters really wanted to be in that office, that creates an environment in the country that I think has a lot of uh, volatility and a lot of people are un unhappy and, and not uh, liking the outcome of, this, of these types of things. So that brings us to how we should elect the president. So the national popular vote. Whoever gets the most votes in the national popular vote wins the election. So this is how we elect almost every office in the country. And we are able to modernize our presidential elections to make every vote equal. Um, and the only elections that aren't using a system of whoever gets the most votes wins, honestly, they're systems that have evolved beyond that, um, that are using things like ranked choice voting or approval voting. Um, there is nowhere else in the country or even in the world that uses an electoral college type system uh, currently. So when we implement national popular vote, we have a system where every vote is equal. Candidates would have to care about the entire population's interests, not just those in swing states. So we break that system where candidates are advocating for positions just because they poll well with certain voters in critical states. You know, um, in the 2020 election, in both the vice presidential debate and then one of the presidential debates, we heard about fracking. Um, now, fracking is an industry that is important to voters in Pennsylvania. Um, it is not something that uh, every state across the country really has a stake in. Um, if at that same time, what we did not hear about were the wildfires that were ravaging much of the country that summer. One in five Americans lived in states that were being affected by those wildfires, and we didn't hear anything about them during the debates. And it's not just, oh, they were all in Democratic states or all in Republican states. They were in both. They were in Idaho. They were in Colorado. Um, you know, they were in Montana. They were in Oregon. 
And as a result, because they those states were safely in one category or the other, it wasn't a pertinent enough topic to be brought up and discussed at the debates. So the way that this bill works, um, and as Ellen said, the, the full name of it is the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. So interstate compact is just the term for how states get into agreements with each other. Um, you know, it's not something we maybe are really hear that often, um, but states are in on average about 30 compacts at any time. Um, and it's just, the, you know, uh, when you buy a house, you and the seller sign the same contract. So when states want to make an agreement with each other, they pass the same bill in their states and they're called interstate compacts. Um, so usually we just refer to it though as the national popular vote bill. So the national popular vote bill would guarantee the presidency to the candidate who wins the most popular votes in all 50 states and DC in the election. So win the popular vote, win the electoral college. And this bill is passed by states to change how they vote in the electoral college. So you replace that law that says the winner take all law that gives all of your electors to the candidate who won the most votes in your state and instead change it to our electors are going to go to whoever won the national popular vote across the country. And this bill only goes into effect when we have enough states committed to it that we can guarantee the outcome of, of the election. So because that number currently is 270, you need 270 electoral votes to win the electoral college. When we get states with 270 electoral votes on board, we have enough votes to win the presidency. All of those laws goes into effect and in at that time be about 20 states that have passed this. Um, and as a result, we know that in the next election, whoever the entire campaigning will be different um, because it will be based on the winner of the nationwide popular vote. Um, and I, I keep emphasizing, uh, you know, nationwide and, and all 50 states in DC, um, because I want to make clear that it is not just the, the states participating, adding up their popular vote and ignoring the rest of the country. That would not make every vote equal. That is not what anyone wants. It is uh, those states working together to recognize the winner of the popular vote in all 50 states in DC. So this uh, bill has already been passed by 16 states with 195 electoral votes. So we are 70% of the way there towards making it happen. And with five or six of you know, the right combination of states, we're gonna make this happen. So this shows some of the progress that we've made around the country. Um, and it's uh, just, you know, the displayed based on the number of electoral votes that each state has um, since the uh, redistricting that happened last year. So green is where we've already passed the bill. Um, yellow and orange indicate where we've passed at least one legislative chamber. Um, and then uh, the blue is where we've had at least a hearing in that state. So as you can see, we've really made progress in much of the country. Um, and we even passed the bill in nine states in at least one chamber uh, representing 88 electoral votes. So if we just were able to carry out and, and continue that momentum in those states, we would have enough electoral votes for the bill to go into effect. So I wanna take a few minutes to talk about some of the most common uh, misconceptions that people have about the current system and about you know, what a national popular vote would look like. Um, so number one, this is a nonpartisan issue. It is not a reaction to Donald Trump's election in 2016. Uh, we were working on this a full decade before he was elected. Um, and it's, so it's not a left or right issue. It's not going to benefit one party or the other. Who it is going to benefit is voters, because for the very first time, every American's vote will be equal in electing the one office that represents every single person in this country. And it is constitutional. You know, a lot of people will uh, hear this and say, no, you've, you've got to do a constitutional amendment to change the electoral college. That's just simply not true. The uh, Article 2, Section 1, those 17 words give the power to the states to decide how to vote within the electoral college. So we're not getting rid of the electoral college. Uh, we're not really changing anything about its structure because that would, that would also take a constitutional amendment. We are reforming it from within by getting states to work together to change how they participate in the electoral college. And this is the same power that 
allowed the states to pass the statewide winner take laws in the first place. Um, and it's the same uh, power that uh, allows Maine and Nebraska to use a, a different system. They use the congressional district system, um, which is why I say, you know, 48 states use this system. Um, so it's that same uh, power that we are using um, from this part of the Constitution to uh, change how the president is elected. And sometimes people will then ask about, okay, uh, well, in the Constitution, it says that congressional consent is required for all interstate compacts. So, you know, what are you going to do about getting congressional consent? Um, so, yes, Article 1, Section 10 does say that congressional consent is required for all interstate compacts. Um, however, the Supreme Court has ruled that that language only refers to compacts that encroach upon federal supremacy. Um, and that's been something that's been precedent for over 100 years. So our bill does not encroach upon federal supremacy. Awarding electors is a state decision. It's in fact explicitly left up to the states. Um, and so we do not believe that we will need congressional consent. Now, if after our bill reaches 270 electoral votes, the Supreme Court decides they want to throw out 100 years of precedent and say, you know, you need congressional consent and so does every other interstate compact moving forward. Um, that's okay. We would go and, and lobby Congress the same way that we have lobbied this bill in all 50 states um, and we would work to get that congressional consent. So if we do have to do that, it's just an additional step. It's not something that would stop the, the movement. Um, and, and a related question I get oftentimes when I bring this up is, uh, concern about the, the current Supreme Court. Uh, and, you know, sometimes people think that uh, some uh, of our justices are more inclined to ignore precedent uh, and, you know, might just, uh, be a little more partisan in how they look at such an important issue. Um, but what I like to point to is the fact that seven, uh, well, now I'm going to have to change the number again, six of our nine uh, justices uh, have ruled on this issue of this uh, absolute power of the states for determining their electors as recently as 2020. Um, so, and they, that was a unanimous decision affirming the absolute right of states to uh, award their electors how they like. Um, and so it would be a, a really big, very big sea change for them to, uh, to go back on that since they just ruled on it that way in 2020. Um, next up, withdrawal. So you are able to leave an interstate compact as a state, um, but it's in the language of the, the contract that states cannot withdraw during a really important six-month period. Um, so between July 20th of a presidential election year and six months later, inauguration day of the following year. So the bill has to be in effect with at least 270 electoral votes by that July 20th deadline. Um, the reason for this, we want candidates to know what system they're running under. Uh, you know, we, they, they should have that ability. So this six-month period covers the entire general election. Um, and then, of course, when our voting happens, the electors voting happens, and when Congress counts the votes all the way up to the next inauguration. Um, and during that time, no one can join the compact either. It's not as if, uh, you know, a month before the election, if the state signed on, uh, it would then say, it would make the bill go into effect. No, it has to be by July 20th of an election year, it has to be in effect. Um, and any state that wanted to join or leave, they could pass a law during that six month period to do so, but it would not be able to go into effect until after the next president was inaugurated. And this is not enforced by me or a secretary of state or a governor anywhere, um, but in fact, by Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so that's the impairments clause, which uh, talks about how uh, states can enter into agreements with each other. Um, so it talks about uh, this issue that states cannot uh, do something unilaterally. So because they agreed to this six-month period when they signed on to the compact, that they have to stick to that when they leave. Um, and no state has ever in the history of our country left an interstate compact without adhering to the terms of the compact. Um, so again, something that's very ironclad that if a state tried to do this, the Supreme Court would rule it to be invalid. 
And of course, often get questions about, you know, what would the founders think of this system? Uh, you know, are, would they be against it? Would they be for it? You know, how much stock should we put into that? What I think is important, uh, you know, regardless of how, of how you come at this question is they didn't create the current system of electing the president. They took 30 votes over 22 different days to determine how the president should be elected. Not a single one of those was on the winner take all law that 48 states use today. It was not thought of at the time. It was not debated at the constitutional convention. It is not mentioned in the Federalist Papers. Um, so it's the current system we use, they did not think of when they were drafting the constitution. Um, so the way that we elect the president now truly is nothing like it was at the founding of our country. However, what is the same is the fact that the, the founders left it up to the states to decide how their electors were chosen. You know, they thought at the time that the states were the closest body to the people. Um, so the state legislature can make the best decision for the for their state. Um, so we're asking state legislatures to consider their constitutional duty exactly as the framers intended. Um, you know, now, uh, back in the 1700s, I don't think they exactly imagined uh, groups like the League of Women Voters coming and lobbying uh, their legislators in state capitals. But you know, they definitely did envision the state legislators being the ones to ultimately make this decision. And oftentimes people think that the current system benefits small states. And so, you know, maybe you're none of you're all in Michigan, you're not in a small state, but maybe you're thinking about moving to Hawaii and you're concerned about that. Um, but the small states are actually the most disadvantaged and ignored group of states under the current system. And that just happens to be because of the 13 states that have three or four electoral votes, six of them are decidedly Republican, six of them are decidedly Democratic, one of them sometimes is a swing state. Um, and so as a result, they are completely ignored election after election. And people, uh, they come at this thinking that the, the small states are going to benefit um, because of the numbers, right? It, Wyoming, uh, our, our lowest population state, has to turn out less voters to control one electoral vote than uh, Florida does, which in 2020 was where you had to turn out the most voters to control one electoral vote. Um, but because of states using the winner take all law, any power that they theoretically could have had as a smaller state, they signed away by having a winner take all law. And the reverse is uh, true. Oh, this is I'm just showing uh, an example from between 2008 and 2016. Um, we had eight states that together had 24 electoral votes. They saw one campaign visit in that entire time between all of them, between three elections. And in that same period of time, Wisconsin uh, with a roughly equal population to those eight states, um, but only 10 electoral votes had 40 visits. Um, so if if the additional weight really uh, was something that was critical and, and small states really had some additional power, you know, you'd hear so goes Delaware, so goes the nation. Uh, but that's really not the case. No one's wondering how the small states are going to go. Um, and you don't just have to take our word for it either. Uh, legislators in Hawaii, Delaware, Vermont, DC, and Rhode Island have signed on to our bill. Um, and so the, the reverse of this is also true that uh, while small states aren't benefiting from the current system and, and would do better under a national popular vote, um, large states are not gonna just somehow control the election uh, if we have a national popular vote. Serious candidates solicit every vote that matters. And every vote in every state is going to matter in a presidential election. So it doesn't matter if you're in Idaho or California, your vote is equal. Now, no one would doubt that California would be ignored under a national popular vote, that candidates would not go there, right? So why would it make sense that they would ignore an equal population of people that just happen to be spread out uh, in smaller states, which is what this is demonstrating, that there are 14 states that have about an equal population to California. They broke in 2016 uh, at the same rate that, uh, that California broke for Hillary Clinton. Um, so it doesn't matter where these uh, your ballot is cast under a national popular vote. Every vote is going to be equal. Um, candidates will be incentivized to campaign in all 50 states. And Again, it's uh, then sometimes the next question is, okay, well, then they're just going to go to the big cities. Um, you know, they're just going to camp out there and not talk to anyone in the suburbs or anyone in rural America. And it's going to be, you know, uh, often the assumption that goes along with that is 
urban areas vote for Democrats and we're always gonna have a Democratic president. So when we look at the numbers, this also just does not make sense. So if you add up the 100 largest cities in the country, um, and number 100 on that list is Spokane, Washington with 208,000 people, which is not exactly a liberal metropolis. Those 100 cities have 19% of the US population. It just so happens that rural America as defined by the US census also makes up 19% of the US population. So you could no more just talk to the 19% of voters in our 100 biggest cities than you could just talk to the 19% of voters in rural America and expect to win. Very importantly, you need to talk to both groups, but also the 62% of Americans that live in the suburbs where they uh, consistently are evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. So candidates are gonna be going all over. They're not just gonna be you know, hanging out in Los Angeles um, and New York City and, and other large places. So we're gonna have uh, candidates campaigning, hopefully in all 50 states, they certainly will have reason to, and every voter in every state will be relevant in presidential elections for the first time. And so we'll, our political system will reflect the reality that I think is true for most of us, that when we cast our presidential ballot, we're not doing it you know, as an Oregonian or a Pennsylvanian or a Floridian, but as Americans, we're thinking about what is the best option for the country. Uh, and so this allows, uh, this change allows our elections to reflect that reality. Uh, we do have a lot of national support, uh, you know, since we've been working on this for over 15 years, uh, a number of national organizations, um, as well as uh, many organizations in the state of Michigan. Um, we have worked on this bill in Michigan uh, before, uh, as far back as 2008, we had a bill there. Um, uh, we passed the House uh, uh, with bipartisan support that year, and we've had a bill in nearly every session since then. Uh, notably in 2018, so after the 2016 election, uh, after the 2016 election, not surprisingly, things got a little bit more partisan in how people view this, even though it remains a nonpartisan issue. Um, but in 2018, we had a bill that was sponsored by 15 Republican senators and 10 Democratic senators in Michigan. Um, I looked at uh, your legislators and for Livingston County, and I hope that these are the correct ones, um, at least under your current maps. Um, and so uh, these individuals, none of them have yet come out um, in support of national popular vote. Um, so certainly would encourage you to write to them and reach out uh, and talk to them about this issue. Um, if you want to get involved, uh, here are some of the ways, you know, as individuals you can do it, um, but also making this a priority, you know, for your affiliate of, with the league for the next session. Um, we are going to be, you know, running a bill in 2023 uh, and, and hope to pass it there. Um, if not, then yes, we're going to um, pick back up our effort to win this issue at the ballot um, in November of 2024. And there will certainly be a lot of work to get that on the ballot and then win the campaign um, if we are going to do that. Um, uh, if, if we do that, Michigan will be the first state where we proactively do a ballot measure. Um, we've only been on the on the ballot one in one other state, um, and we were forced there by a veto referendum. Um, so it would be a, a very big undertaking, uh, and a, and we did win that campaign. Uh, but it would be a big undertaking uh, if we chose to do that. Um, so there will, of course, be lots of work to do all around the state. And with that, um, I am going to stop there and. Uh, take any questions that you all might have. Um, if, if you don't mind, everyone, you're welcome to unmute yourself and show your video if you'd like to. And that way we could answer, see who you are, if you comfortable with that and asking your questions. Um, I don't see any hands up right now, but I'd like to ask something, Eileen. Could you describe what it would look like once a these 270 um, electoral votes are, are met, that benchmark is met, then what would the next presidential election, what would it look like? I keep thinking of CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and everybody just going crazy on how to report this. What would that look like? 
Yeah. So when it comes to the reporting, it, it would change everything. Honestly, uh, candidates are going to be looking at polling nationwide um, as opposed to just where can I do better in Pennsylvania? Um, and so that's the entire conversation up around the election would be about popular vote. You know, what's the, how does the nation feel, not just how do Georgians feel? On election night, uh, I think we wouldn't necessarily really see the 270 map anymore um, because we would know that whoever gets the most votes across the country is going to be the person who wins the electoral college. So I imagine that that would be the count that they're looking at uh, is uh, maybe a bar chart of going back and forth of whichever candidate is ahead. Um, it is likely, although not certainly guaranteed, um, that more likely than under the current system, that we will know the outcome of the election on election night. Um, you know, in 2020, it was drawn out for three days because they were counting votes in uh, several battleground states in Georgia and Arizona and Pennsylvania. But uh, we knew on election night who was winning the popular vote. Uh, you know, Joe Biden was about 3 million votes ahead uh, when, by, by midnight. And so uh, in the future, we could expect that the if those numbers are similar, that we'll know on election night. Claire? Well, I think you just answered my question at the very end there. I was thinking that the popular vote would take longer for results, but you're saying probably not. Yeah, um, because I mean, all the states are counting their votes independently. Um, and so, you know, most of them are able to count most of their votes, you know, within the first couple of hours after the election. Um, and we could expect, I think, the popular vote to be enough of a margin between the two candidates that it, it will be pretty clear which one is going to be uh, ahead. Now, that's certainly not guaranteed, um, but based on how our elections have been recently, that's, I think that's what you could expect as we get larger margins between the popular vote winners. Kathy and Russ have their hand raised, but you're muted, so. Here I am. Uh, how would the time zones during the election affect the popular vote on the tabulation? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so currently, uh, it, all of that is up to state law, how late your uh, polls are open in your state. So even within, you know, just on, you know, let's take the East Coast and Eastern time zone, some states stop uh, allowing voting at 8 p.m. Some of them it's at 7 p.m. Some of them are at 7.30. Um, so you would just see those numbers coming in the same way that we do now. That, you know, uh, I, I'm thinking of the 2020 election. There's like an alarm at 7.30 saying, okay, polls just closed in Florida. Well, okay, let's, let's wait for the numbers to come in. So I think you'd have that same uh, general activity happening where you're just adding up states by state. Um, but it, it wouldn't really uh, be too much affected by time zones. Um, you know, it, and if we take, you know, on the furthest coast, except for Alaska and Hawaii, California obviously is a, a really large state. Um, but because of how large they are, you know, they have different laws for counting ballots that allow them to start counting them earlier. So if you cast a ballot a week ahead of time, they can start that tabulation process earlier. They're not allowed to release it. But at, you know, let's say eight o'clock on election night, they might already know how 40% of ballots are counted. Thank you. Can I, um, I don't see another hand up, so I have another question, and I'm trying to get my, wrap my head around, you have so many states that you meet, meet, meet that 270 electoral votes, and so those states all agree that they're going to go with um, popular vote. Whoever has a popular vote wins. So what happens to those other electoral votes, those others that don't choose to join? What happens, are they doing the electoral college? How does that work? Yeah, so they stick with their current state laws unless they change it to something else. So, uh, you know, let's say Maine is still uh, not is not a part of the compact, then they'll still count their votes based on the congressional district. Uh, they will just know that their popular vote is the one that ultimately matters rather than the results in their state. Um, by law, those would still have to be reported um, in all of those states, what, what the count is. Those electors would still go and cast their ballots. Those ballots would still be counted you know, by Congress, um, but, but they wouldn't really be determinative of the election. Um, what could also be very likely to happen though, you know, if you have a candidate winning uh, the popular vote, 
it's very likely that out of the remaining 30 states, they're going to have won the popular vote in some of those states as well. Um, so we are, could see true landslide victories in the Electoral College where someone has 400 electoral votes, uh, you know, and the other candidate has only won 138. Interesting. Fascinating. Are there any more questions? I don't see any more questions and we're just about out of time. We have about eight minutes left. Um, I don't see anything else. Um, okay, I brought this up prior to our starting and maybe you could just touch on what are the arguments against changing from the Electoral College? Now, um, a lot of it is rooted in a in misunderstanding. Um, you know, I was just talking to someone about this last night. It's a term we refer to as folk civics, that a lot of people think what they know about the Electoral College is accurate, uh, like that it does benefit safe state, or excuse me, small states, and that they are deserving of that additional clout. Um, but it doesn't actually help them because of the way that they have chosen to participate. Um, and there's nothing that says that they have to have that. The Senate exists to give equal suffrage to all the states. They don't have to have an additional weight in the Electoral College. And so it's little things like that that often people get hung up on. Um, and I mean, it's what I was taught. I think it's what's been taught, honestly, for, for decades in this country are these things that are just not entirely accurate uh, because we have this such a strange system that most people don't really entirely know the whole history of. Um, and so a lot of those things are what people get caught on. Um, what we, if we zoom out to kind of the bigger conversation, uh, something we often hear is people saying, okay, well, in the last 30 years, Republicans have won the popular vote once. I'm a Republican. Why would I support this when I, I think that my candidate is never going to win the popular vote in the future and never be president? Um, so that's a big one. Uh, but there's a good answer to that and why that's not going to be the case. Candidates currently are not trying to win the popular vote. Uh, the last time that they really did, honestly, was in 2004. Um, because George Bush had lost the popular vote in 2000, um, he wanted to win the popular and the electoral college in 2004, and he did win the popular vote. Um, and so we, we have to keep that in mind, that it's going to be a completely different campaign. Uh, you know, voters are going to be newly incentivized all across the country. Uh, Turnout in battleground states tends to be about 9% higher than in the rest of the country. So we could say that in about 38 states, we're gonna have 9% more of their voters coming out to vote. Um, and it might even be higher because people will truly know that every vote is equal. Um, and then the one other thing that I'll add on to that is that quite frankly, uh, where Republican candidates uh, recently have been campaigning in to win the presidency, they've been doing quite well. Um, in 2016, Donald Trump, won the popular vote within the battleground states. And of course, he was able to do that in a way that allowed him to win the Electoral College. In 2020, he actually also won the popular vote again in the battleground states by a million votes, but he didn't win it in the right combination of states to win the Electoral College. Um, so if I were an advisor to any Republican candidate for president, I'd say, okay, on one hand, you've got this system where you can do really well, but you lost by 5,200 votes in one state. And so because of that, you're not gonna win the election, even though everywhere you campaigned, you got a million more votes. Uh, or we can go to the simpler system uh, where we know whoever gets the most votes is gonna be the person who wins. Um, I think this is a little bit further out, but at some point, let's let's say we don't get national popular vote passed you know, in the near future. Texas is continuing to go blue. Um, and if the Republicans were to lose that those guaranteed 40 electoral votes, it would be very hard for them to win uh, the Electoral College without Texas. Good point. Kathy and Ross, you have another question. Yeah, so still the, elector, the electors could still vote the way they want to, whether the whether it's a popular vote or not. They could still not follow what we're supposed to do, what, there's, what they signed up to do. There's always that, um, right? Uh, well, that varies also state by state. Um, I'm very quickly looking this up um, for Michigan. Uh, if you do not in Michigan cast your ballot for the person that you uh, pledged to before the election, uh, you are replaced as an elector with someone else who will vote for that person. 
Um, we, we have alternate slates of electors uh, kind of as backup. Um, and the thing to think about this is uh, we get asked this a lot after 2016 because there were a number of people who uh, were faithless electors. They did not vote for the person that was expected. Um, but those were defections from Hillary Clinton to Republican candidates that were not Donald Trump uh, because they were trying. It was a coordinated effort to try and have a movement of people that, OK, is there another Republican that we can support over Trump? that Republican electors will vote for, which they did not get a single person to do that. Um, so that very much is in people's minds because that happened, but it isn't something that happens regularly. And only one time in our nation's history has a, one single vote been cast in a way that uh, was faithless and could have been determinative of uh, changing the election. And that was in 1796. Um, so I, I very much understand like why this sounds like a concern, but really when it comes down to it, you know, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't know offhand for Michigan. I live in Oregon. The people that the electors are the Democratic, for let's say for the Democrats, Democratic Party chair, Democratic vice party chair, and then the chairs of our six congressional districts. So they are very much people that are, they want their candidate to win. Uh, it's sometimes in some states, it's donors in, in Pennsylvania, um, the, the candidates can just pick whoever they want. Um, so it's people that are very unlikely to go against the candidate. And in about 33 states, they have laws that say, if you don't vote for who you're expected to, you're replaced with someone that, that will. Thank you. Okay. Well, we are just about out of time. I don't see any more hands up. And Eileen, this is fascinating information. And thank you. I just love your enthusiasm about the um, topic. There's no doubt about it. And it just makes total sense. Um, both both sides of the aisle can obviously see the, um, the, the rationale to it. So um, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to share this recording um, far and wide. And I encourage everyone here tonight to go to the National Popular Vote website. It's chock full of additional information if you'd like to share it with anybody. Uh, so um, as Janice has said, yes, I hope we can pass this too. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to Jamie now to wrap it up for the evening for us. All right, thank you, Ellen. And thank you so much, Eileen, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us this evening. Thanks again to our partner, the League of Women Voters of Livingston County for making this evening possible. Visit their website, www.lwvlivingstonco.org to learn more about the organization and how you can become involved. And thank you all for attending tonight's program. We hope you enjoyed it. Please take a few minutes to tell us what you thought about this program in the short event evaluation linked in the chat. Um, our next League of Women Voters and Howell Library Partnership program will be on Tuesday, May 17th at 7 p.m. Please watch our website for more information. Um, please visit our website, www.howellibrary.org, to discover more upcoming events from the Howell Carnegie District Library as well. Thank you, everyone, and good night. <laughs>